Welcome to Dyslipidemia Management 2014. These are views on the news, the most topical news in cardiovascular medicine, presented by Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. You're tuned in to today's first session titled, The New ACC AHA Cholesterol Guidelines, a roundtable with the experts. This has been a very topical issue. It's very newsworthy still, and I'm delighted to be able to present this program to you today. My name is Dr. Clyde Yancey, and I'm chief of the Division of Cardiology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm pleased to serve as chair for this important educational program and to serve as co-chair for Cardio Care Live. Joining me today are Dr. Jennifer Robinson, professor in the Departments of Epidemiology and Medicine at the University of Iowa College of Medicine and College of Public Health, and Dr. Donald Lloyd-Jones, Professor of Preventive Medicine and Medicine and Cardiology at Northwestern University Farnbrook School of Medicine, one of my colleagues. Delighted to have both Jennifer and Don here, affectionately known as DLJ at the shop. <laughs> Thanks, Clyde. Thanks, Clyde. Um, Jennifer, let's just get right to it. Let me first of all let the audience know that this is a live, interactive program. What that means is that it allows us to take real questions in real time throughout the presentation. I'll share those questions with both you and Don as we go forward. This is an especially important aspect of the program given the nature of what the two of you will be discussing. So I encourage you, our audience, to send us your questions anytime by typing them in the box located at the lower left-hand side of your screen. Now, Jennifer, let's get right into it. This is really good stuff. Please begin your presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to set the stage for what we did because we were convened as ATP4 many years ago <laughs> by the NHLBI and it took a number of years to, to, to engage in the process uh, where we really changed how we approached the guidelines. We kind of moved away from a group of experts in a room who, of course, were aware of what the data was, but we instead started from the data. We asked, and let's start from the actual beginning, ATP, the Adult mm -hmm. Treatment Panel, Correct. right? Let's be certain that everyone understands what we're doing, and there were three predecessor panels. That's correct. That's Terrific. correct. Terrific. That's correct. And so what we did was really start from the data. I mean, we all came in as experts and had preconceived notions, but we put those aside, started with the data, asked critical questions, did systematic reviews, and constructed a series of evidence statements from which we then developed recommendations. So this is really a, a, a process that, that's been advocated really as sort of the, the modern approach to really start with the data and, and I move forward. And I think the thing you're setting mm -hmm. is that this is truly an evidence-based approach and I think Absolutely. that's going to permeate our entire Absolutely. discussion. Absolutely. Right. Terrific. Now we focused on randomized controlled trials and meta-analyses of those trials um, because we thought that's really what we're doing. We're treating patients with drugs <laughs> and we need to know who it works in and who it doesn't work in. So that's what we did. And then finally in 2013 we transitioned to the ACC AHA for, AHA for the dissemination and implementation phase. So that's just some background in case you know people can kind of know where we came from. We had three critical questions. First we examined the evidence for LDL and non-HDL goals in both primary and secondary prevention. And then we had kind of a third question that asked, well what's the evidence for atherosclerotic risk reduction in both primary and secondary prevention for statin and non-statin drugs. So we ended up actually capturing the universe of right. clinical trials to answer these, these questions and make our guidelines. Um, and so I'm going to go through now and give you an overview of our recommendations. Obviously, you come up with a longer list, but I think these are what clinicians really need to know to practice. And I'm going to kind of emphasize the level of evidence because there are some things that are really important to do based on a large amount of evidence and other things that we may not have a lot of evidence for, but based, as experts, we think might be reasonable things to do, but we really tried to minimize that. Let me just tell you, the audience is already sending in questions. Yeah, okay, <laughs> so this great. Is a good, thing. good. Well, I, I think, you know, it's, it's just a change. We, we update how we do things in science, and, and this is really, I think, the cutting edge of how we Terrific. do recommendations. So the first one is we wanted to look at treat, drug treatments of blood cholesterol to reduce atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk not to make numbers look better or other reasons, but really we have to have a proven reduction in heart attack and stroke uh, to make our decisions. I also want to emphasize healthy lifestyle is the foundation for atherosclerotic risk reduction. We don't minimize the importance of that, but this is a drug 
guideline. There are other guidelines, both the lifestyle and obesity guidelines that were published simultaneously that address specific evidence-based recommendations for those areas. Um, but again, lifestyle recommendations were the, the foundation for all the drug studies. They all occurred in the background of recommendations uh, to, to have a heart-healthy diet, engage in regular physical activity, and improve risk factors. And then finally, uh, I think what we came up with was that the appropriate intensity of statin therapy to reduce atherosclerotic risk in those most likely to benefit was, is really the key fundamental point of our guidelines. We actually quantitated both the benefit and the potential for adverse effects to try to come up with net benefit to, to really identify the people who are likely to benefit. And that we came up with four statin benefit groups for which there's strong evidence, two or more randomized trials that showed a reduction in atherosclerotic events. And of course, there are other groups that could benefit from statins, so we tried to address those as well. So we did not find, uh, our, in, for our first two critical questions, we just didn't find any evidence from the randomized trials that titration to specific LDL goals or non-HDL goals, there just was no evidence. So we really thought it was probably reasonable not to perpetuate that, but to, to focus on what the evidence actually shows. Um, and the problem we also found with treat to tar target, you know, LDL less than 100, LDL less than 70 in previous US guidelines, is you can't calculate a net benefit. I mean, you don't know who you, who's most likely to you know, experience an atherosclerotic risk reduction benefit without an excess of harm. So if you can't do those two things, it's hard to make <laughs> graded evidence-based recommendations. You can certainly make expert recommendations, and those are a different thing. And I'd also want to point out, uh, and the other problem we had, again, we were a group of experts. We, you know, we've been doing this for decades. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, uh, but, you know, we were also afraid if we continued to perpetuate LDL goals is that it could result in non-stat, suboptimal statin therapy or the use of non-statin therapy for which there was no evidence. Just as a couple of examples, you know, if your LDL is 95 on pravastatin 10 milligrams and you have heart disease, you're actually getting suboptimal care. I mean, that's not what the evidence shows. And there are also safety concerns with combination therapy especially in the setting of high intensity stands that just haven't been quantitated. So before you move on, uh, let's go back mm -hmm. one graphic because I think it's important to capture this incredible mm -hmm. statement you've made so far. This is an evidence-based approach and there were three overarching goals to reduce ASCVD risk, to emphasize lifestyle as the foundation of reducing risk, and to use varying degrees of statin therapy as a proven to be effective regimen to modify risk. That is really important. That's the backbone of what Absolutely. we're talking about. And here you've identified what's not in the backbone. Right, <laughs> What right. we don't know and what we don't have. Right. And so as people are now taking several months to digest everything, really is important to get those emphatic points made. So great job with that. Absolutely, thank you. So let's say what, this is actually what we said. Uh, this is our uh, revised figure one because we, it was a little confusing in the previous, but this one kind of summarizes, I think, everything we said very nicely. So I'd like to point out the color scheme. So green is the class one recommendations. These are really the must do, should do right. sorts of things based just on an extensive body of evidence. And that's to treat people with clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease if they're under 75 or up to 75 with a high intensity statin, although if they have characteristics where you're concerned about safety, a moderate intensity statin would be perfectly appropriate. After age 75 or if there are other uh, characteristics you're concerned about safety, they're not a candidate for high intensity statin, use moderate intensity statins. Again, there's just a vast amount of evidence right. for this group and it's regardless of what their LDL is. The second important group is, are people with genetic high cholesterol. We thought we'd make it easy for clinicians, an LDL of 190 or greater. Don't worry if it's familial or anything else. That's too high of an LDL for anybody. And they should get a high intensity statin to try to reduce that number uh, as much as possible. And again, uh, not a lot of clinical trials in this group uh, of FH patients, but there's certainly a vast amount of evidence for benefit in people with LDLs over 190. People with diabetes, either type 1 or type 2, but age 40 to 75, we thought we could, on the basis of the trials, make a very strong recommendation for moderate intensity statins in that group. And obviously, this is a high risk group. Uh, you know, these people are ultimately going to die of cardiovascular disease. Certainly, 
will benefit from statin therapy. And so we, to make it consistent with the primary...